So hi everybody, I'm Steve Taylor. Uh, I work, Trace and I are part of Deploy Hub. So we'll dive in here. We're gonna kind of pick up where Tracy left off um, and really talk about how we're gonna do what we need to do in this uh, DevOps world. So one of the things that um, we're gonna address is, are your pipelines um, working to prevent supply chain attacks? I mean, we think they are, some of them are. Um, there's a lot to preventing a supply chain uh, attack. Um, the other thing we need to look at is, are they compliant? with what our CISO uh, office really wants us to look at. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna really look at, are we working to prevent something or are they compliant? What are those meanings? And we're gonna take it from there and look at how do we actually make our changes. So some stats, 64% um, of our companies out there have been attacked on the supply chain side. Um, that huge growth rate with where, you know, what the attack plane is, you know, focus, focus mainly on uh, the supply chain. Uh, like Tracy said, from the JFrog, uh, 227 days, obviously 100% increase in CVEs. Um, I think that one, uh, the CVE part is because we're actually looking for them now. Um, so that one's, they've always been there. I don't think we're always reporting upon them. So I think that one's kind of misleading uh, at that level. And then uh, on this side, you know, we, we're gonna need S-bombs. Um, Cause that's the kind of our, our pathway to fixing some of this stuff. So like I said, I'm, I'm with Deploy Hub. Um, I've been doing DevOps engineering forever. Uh, and I wrote one of our, one of the first commercial tools around uh, the build space. Um, back in 95, our Open Make Meister uh, product uh, generated make files. Anybody know what a make file is? Okay, got some Ned's hot going there. Well, when we did that, we controlled the input, what was happening, and we actually embedded all your dependencies into your executable. And then we had another executable called OMIDENT. And you could ident the SBOM out of your executable. It was easy back then, because with, um, with like the C programming language, we actually generated a, a C program on the fly and put all of it into the data uh, segment. And when you look at an executable, you can actually parse out the data segment. So we were actually able to embed SBOMs back in 95. Um, that is me. I am actually a, a volunteer firefighter. Um, that's me in my wild land gear. Um, quick tip on the firefighting side, always wear your seatbelt. Believe it or not, if you get in a rollover with your seatbelt, you'll be walking away. You'll be sore, but you'll be walking away. I've seen some crazy stuff on that front, but it actually, um, they work. <laughs> so um, some things to check out. Uh, the, the, the first, the top one and the bottom one are from NIST. Um, the framework on the top is actually pretty good. Um, it's pretty high level for you to get a, uh, an idea. Um, they kind of read like a PhD thesis, you know, so they can be a little dry. Um, the middle one from the OpenSSF uh, basically is a, a better one. Um, CNCF, sorry. Uh, around your supply chain best practices. So take a look at those, uh, grab some ideas from there. Um, and it kind of gives you some goals to work towards. Uh, one of the things that you'll recognize in this whole DevOps, DevSecOps world, it's a journey. Um, you're not gonna get there overnight, but keep on adding pieces a little bit at a time. Now, one of the tricks when we talk about adding pieces is how are we, how are we gonna get there? you know, because there's gonna be a bunch of different tools that are needed. Um, some of the things when you look at those um, publications, some of the key takeaways is, you know, make sure your repo secure. This is where like the second one down, the open um, the OpenSSF scorecard helps you on that front. 
you know, branch protection, reviewers, um, uh, depend about, you know, those type of things being implemented. Um, kicking off your, the salsa pieces for your secure build, you know, basic things like ephemeral build machines, um, you know, things like that. Uh, signing, um, one of the simplest things you can do is, you know, GitHub just went through this process of making a, a two-factor authentication, now mandatory on your repos. Well, now make all your developers have a, a, a GPG key and sign all their commits. And then also make them have their uh, signed off by. So it says, you'll see all my kids will, commits will say signed off by Steve Taylor. It, they're easy things to get around. You know, you could fake GPG keys, you could fake signed off buys, but it's one more step in the process that you give you a little boost of security on that front. And then finally, we got to automate this stuff. Because um, when we look at what's needed in our pipelines, um, we keep on being asked to add more things. There's a new tool coming out. There's going to be, you know, the latest one is generate SBOMs. That's one of the, the, the latest crazes, like I, I would say, that's out there is, all right, we needed an SBOM. Um, What's going to become more popular is going to be the DAST in your pipeline. Most of the time, people think about testing as send it over to the testers and QA group, let them hand, uh, hammer it out, um, and that's just going to bottleneck everything. How many people still do monthly releases or longer? Uh, there's some out there. How many people do daily releases? Hourly? Nobody? All right. That's where we're going to have to get to. You know, we, we're going to have to get to those, those hourly releases of you have something uh, de uh, depend about chugs lawn or renovate. I found a package that's out of date. Let me bump it. Go off, bump it, run your, um, your build, do your SAS, do your DAST, generate your SBOM, check if I have any vulnerabilities, run through an OPA. Oh, good to go. Out the door it goes. We do that in 20 minutes. That whole process is part of our pipeline now. So some of the tools um, that we're being asked to add, like I said, uh, scorecard, uh, great on the, if you're GitHub fan. Um, it does have some GitLab um, integrations, but it's mostly designed around GitHub. Um, it gives you a good feel for where you're at. You know, there's different scores for, there's like 15 different metrics scores and give you an overall score at that level. We wanna grab that information, how well you're conforming to the salsa best practices. Um, everybody thinks salsa is, a, is like a tool. It's not, it's just a, a, a set of practices you have to put in place. So implementing salsa uh, involves many different pieces of that puzzle. Um, Another one that I, I consider pretty free uh, is Cosign. Um, that one, uh, you can implement the keyless signing um, pretty much with one command line. It ends up on a blockchain ledger that's outside your organization, so you just have to be aware of that. And they give you a big warning about that, but it, it does give you that signing that you can verify. OSV Dev. A uh, nice consolidated, consolidated database for all your vulnerabilities. Pulls in Miter, pulls in GitHub, Pyth uh, the Python ones, uh, all that. SPDX, obviously, is one of the standards for the SBOM format. Um, the one I like better is Cyclone, because it's easier to deal with than an uh, um, object database. Other ones you can get for free. CodeQL, Dependapot, uh, like I said, the GPG key and the signed off by. Like I said, um, the other one, and then, uh, then depend upon, check out the men's renovate. Um, other ones that, are, that aren't up here that we, you should think about would be linters, uh, super linter, mega linter. Um, and again, getting in some of the open source DAS and SAS tools that are out there. Um, Zap proxy. Uh, is a nice DAST one. 
It'll basically take any endpoint and throw data at it and see if it can break it, which is great. You know, what, what is your, your endpoint, your REST API endpoint going to do with a two gig file? Most of them will accept it. Then it'll bring down your server. You know, it's just one of those things you just don't think about as a developer. So what we went through is just a short list of, of tools that are out there. Now, like we were talking, Trace was talking to earlier with Mark, and you know, we got millions of workflows to update. How are we gonna do this? You know, and like I said, this is just the short list. There's gonna be some other, next week there'll be a new tool that we wanna add to our, our pipeline. So what we're talking about is um, from the Artilius side, we're, gonna, we're in the process of creating what we call the hero project. Um, and we're gonna put out some fires here. Basically, we're, we want to take CD events, Artilius, and then the CI CD tools and start linking them together. These pieces have, done, have been done individually. You know, we've had, uh, there's a CD events plugin for Jenkins. Um, Spinnaker has a CD events plugin. Um, Ortelius is out there grabbing this information. Um, we're gonna plumb it all together. And that's what the Hero Project is about, is plumbing all this together and make it a reality. Um, on the CD events, they did some small POCs to make sure that the idea behind CD events was working. We're gonna build upon those and really take it to the next level. So it's um, a big project, um, a lot of visibility uh, to make it happen. And one of the things in our process is uh, we don't want to go through and ask a developer to do a thing. Have you asked a developer to do something for you? They don't. <laughs> they say, go talk to my manager. And the manager then talks to the director. And then that director talks to another director. And then by the time it comes back around to you, it's like two months later and you forgot about it. You know, so it's one of these things that we have to do all this without a asking the developer or even the DevOps engineers uh, to make this happen. Um, we're gonna have to make it happen through CD events and, the, and a message queue where we can, and this is the stretch, making or having a DevOps, you know, a Jenkins admin or a Spinnaker admin go in and check a box to say enable CD events for me. And, you know, it sounds simple to ask somebody to check a box, but that could be pulling teeth. So it, it's one of those things that we're going to work at. We're going to need some help out there uh, to make this happen. So this is kind of covered earlier. You know, what is CD events? Basically, um, a cloud event. We're going to throw it into a queue. We're gonna persist the data that comes into the queue into an Arango database. So we have the historical parts of it. Um, it's gonna send around payloads that we get to keep track of, like when was the artifact published? What was the workflow, the Git repo? Okay, here's a dirty little secret about SBOMs. Kind of make me joke. Um, how many people think in an SBOM or know in an SBOM that the SBOM contains stuff about the source code. So does an SBOM contain information about the source code? Mm. Hands, yes or no? Yes, yes, no, Mark says no, no. One of the weird things when you look at an SBOM, it's the packages. It's a list of packages that you're consuming. It doesn't tell you the source code that created the package. And if you wanna go find the source code that created a package, depending upon the language, you can't. Take Python, or let's take Java. In, in the Java world, when you create a jar file using your POM file, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna go through your build process, you're gonna run Maven, you're gonna create your, job, your jar file, or you're gonna upload it to Maven Central. And then another, somebody else downloads that jar file and you can see in your SBOM, 
great, I'm using log4j one, version 121. Cool. Let me go, I wanna go look at that source code for version 121 and see if it fixes the, the log for shell problem. Okay, I go get the plural, I know the repo, I know where it came from, it came from Maven Central, I'm positive. Get out the Maven Central, okay, where's the, the, the source code repo for it? It's optional. So you have no way of knowing where the source code is for log4j for you to go verify. So that's one of the missing things when you look at SBOMs is that link between the artifact and the repo. And if you look at like some of the Debian packages, where do you think those live? Anybody know where Debian lives? Is it in Git? Is it in GitHub? Is it in like GitLab, Bitbucket? Could be, but in what, in what SCM repository? Subversion. Anybody use Subversion lately? And we're talking about, you know, the, the OpenSSF scorecard, all built around GitHub. It has no clue what to do with Subversion. It falls over. So those are the things that we have to kind of um, keep track of and the CD events is gonna help us uh, do that. And again, once we start that event processing, we're gonna get some cool stuff coming out of it. You know, we're gonna get our S-bombs. Um, one of the things when we hook in to the event process, um, especially at the build level, and we get kicked out, uh, get an event from the build, we'll be able to part of the payload is know what commit created that build. Crucial link, knowing the repo and the commit. We can do a lot of stuff with that. OpenSSF scorecard only works off of, the get, uh, off of the repo URL and the commit if you wanna get the score for a project. If you don't have that information or if it's in subversion, you don't get it. So what we're looking to do, I, like I said, is really pull together all this information. And these are just the first four that we're gonna be looking at to start with. Um, we're gonna be continually adding on more tools. Um, so if we get a new memory scanner, um, one of our partners asked, I wanna know all the encryption algorithms used in the code. I wanna find out if they're using uh, an elliptical curve for signing, or I wanna find out if they're using um, SHA-1. You know, GitHub was using SHA-1 forever, and they figured out, well, I think we should move to SHA-256, and then they figured out, oh, now we need to move to 512. So that was one of their core requirements is to, to scan for um, the algorithms that developers are using, developer pr best practices. Um, there's another request that came in. What are all the open source projects? What do their governance documents look like? Do they have a, a CLA that somebody has to sign? Um, how many maintainers are there? All that, that stuff about the community we need to gather. But we're gonna start simple. With, with some of the tools that we can grab that's out there. And again, the kind of the dashboard, this is just a small version. There's another 50 fields that we're gonna add to it. So if you're a UI person, like drawing pictures, come see me please. I'm terrible at UIs. Um, again, looking at the, the ability to search all this data and one of the interesting things that Tracy never didn't really talk about is um, on the Ortelius side, we look at where things are running to. So was this artifact pushed over to um, Docker Hub or was it pushed off to Artifact Hub? You know, what was the, the staging area or the production environment for that Docker image? And then if you, take that Docker image, let's say you're taking Postgres and you're gonna run Postgres inside your Kubernetes cluster. That's gonna be another deployment environment. Now, because we have two different deployment environments, I can compare them. I can say, take my production Kubernetes cluster and compare it to Artifact Hub 
and see how, to, how much drift I have between those two versions and keep things up to date. Because that's one of the things that when we talk about everybody running their workflows once a year and doing deployments once a year, you, we, we have to go a little faster. So to make this happen, what we're looking for is if we go back to the, um, I'll kind of go back here. We're looking for a few folks. If I can find it, one more, two more. There we are. So we're looking for folks on the left-hand side. So if you're either running Jenkins, Spinnaker, it doesn't really matter to us. We're looking for somebody that, that does a decent number of workflows that's willing to be a guinea pig to feed us data. Um, we need some folks to help us write the message queue. There are some implementations out there that we can build off of, uh, like off of Kafka, um, Knative events. Um, so we do have some coding in the middle part to do. And then on the Ortelia side, we have to suck those events in. Um, ar around all this, there's evangelizing, getting the, you know, um, doing talks like I am, um, really bringing out what we found and showing off our new shiny object. Um, past this, once we start getting the data, if you're interested in ML, AI, there's, we, once we get a little bit of this data coming in, we'll be able to do some um, extra cool things with that. So with that, I think that's gonna be it for me. Um, I hope I didn't bore you at the end of the day. Thank you for hanging in there and not falling asleep. So thank you, everybody.